The shooter in El Paso posted a manifesto online consumed by racist hate. In one voice, our nation must condemn racism, bigotry, and white supremacy. These sinister ideologies must be defeated. Hate has no place in America. Hatred warps the mind, ravages the heart, and devours the soul. The president did not, however, address any of his own statements, which had been called racist. However, former President Obama did. Without naming President Trump, he said in a statement, quote, we should soundly reject language coming out of the mouths of any of our leaders that feeds a climate of fear and hatred or normalizes racist sentiments. Late today, Anderson exclusively spoke with Joe Biden, and this notion dominated the conversation. You entered the campaign saying that this is, in your opinion, a battle for the soul of the nation. Given the violence of the last couple of days, who's winning the battle? Uh, the, uh, the white supremacists are winning the battle. This is, this is domestic terrorism. I mean, look, when those folks came out of the fields in Charlottesville, uh, their veins bulging and, I mean, this, just, just coming out from under the rocks carrying torches, the uh, same anti-Semitic bile that was spewed in Europe and, and Germany in the 30s, accompanied by white supremacists and Ku Klux Klan, and a young woman gets killed and the president gets asked, well, tell us about what you think. And he said, there's very fine people on both sides. For God's sake. You, no president's ever said it. And he's just continued it. You talked about, though, Charlottesville being a defining moment. Do you see this as, a, as another defining moment? Absolutely. It's a, but, but, you know, it's a continuation. I mean, this is, uh, this is a president who uh, continues to speak in ways that just are completely contrary to everything who we are. I mean, referring to immigrants as, you know, uh, Mexicans as rapists and talking about, you know, the rats in Baltimore. I mean, the way he talks about people. Do you, do you blame the president in part for what happened in El Paso? I don't, I don't, well, what I do is his rhetoric contributes to this notion that it, is, it almost legitimates people coming out from under the rocks. I mean, this this is white nationalism. This is this is this is this is terrorism of, of a different sort, but it's still terrorism. Beto O'Rourke has said that he believes the president is a white nationalist. Do you? Well, let me put it this way: whether he is or not, he sure is using the language of and contributing to the kinds of things that they say. The idea that uh, this guy in, uh, in 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 El Paso talked about what he's going to do is going to keep paraphrasing keep the, uh, these, these folks from South America and these Latinos and Mexicans and Guatemala from polluting America, from overtaking our society, uh, wiping out, uh, you know, who we are. I mean, it just, it, it just is the kind of thing that the president uh, can, contributes to. And for the first time today, the first time I've ever heard him say he condemns white, white supremacy, white terrorism. When President Trump today said, you know, we have to uh, defeat white supremacy, bigotry, hatred. You don't believe he... No, well, let's start to... Show me something then. From this point on, show me something. Can you imagine if you had children in a school where the principal, after a terrible shooting or after what happened in Charlottesville or what happened in El Paso or it happened in Ohio, in Dayton, stood up and said, well, you know, there's really good, fine people on both sides. Or, you know, there really are a lot of really bad people coming across the border and they're going to pollute our society. All those things he said, paraphrasing him. What do you think would happen? Parents would be asking for that principal to be fired. Mm. And if anything happened in that school, would they say he's the, he, he caused it? Well, maybe he didn't cause it, but he sure, in fact, did not do anything to make it clear it's reprehensible conduct that will not be tolerated. So you don't go as far as, uh, as Beto O'Rourke to say that uh, the president is a white nationalist. I think Cory Booker said uh, that the president is to blame for this because of the, uh, the rhetoric and his lack of action on guns. Clearly, his actions have done nothing to do anything other than encourage this kind of behavior. That going to whether he's, I'm not sure what this guy believes, if he believes anything. Uh, that's just, just not opportunity. An opportunist to be able to continue to maintain his base and to divide the country. That may be behind the rhetoric you're saying, an effort basically to, 
to stoke white supremacists or white nationalists to at least give them a dog whistle? Well, it is, it, they do have a dog whistle. They do have a dog whistle. Look, this, this is a president who has said things no other president has said since Andrew Jackson. Nobody said anything like the things he's saying. And the idea that it doesn't contribute to or legitimate or make it more rational for people to think that we, in fact, can now speak out. We can speak out and be more straightforward and we can make this an issue. We've been through this before. We've been through this before in, in, the, in, in the 20s with the Ku Klux Klan, 50,000 people walking down Pennsylvania Avenue in pointed hats and their robes as they, in fact, decided they didn't want any Catholics coming into the country. We went through it after the Civil War in terms of the Ku Klux Klan and white supremacy. This is about separating people and the good and bad in his mind. It's about making, it's about an access to power. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a trait used by charlatans all over the world. Divide people, divide them, pit them against one another. If that's the case, I mean, it is a very dangerous game then that he is playing. Oh, no, no, there's no question it's a dangerous game. There's no question that his rhetoric has contributed to, at a minimum, at a minimum, of dumbing down the way in which we as a society talk about one another. The way we, we've always been, look, we've always brought the country together. We've never, you know, we the people, we hold these truths self-evident. He flies in the face of all the basic things that we've never really met the standard, we've never abandoned it before. He looks like he's just flat abandoned the theory that we are one people. In, in terms of the, the actual things he talked about today, in terms of action, uh, early in the morning, he had tweeted about the idea of linking uh, background checks or, or stronger background checks with uh, immigration reform. He, that, he never mentioned it after tweeting about it. I guess maybe he talked that, about there, There's an example I mean. Why don't we have background checks for the guys like, who, in fact, do these terrible things? They're not immigrants that are doing this. They're American citizens who are doing these things. Does the, does the idea of linking action on stronger background checks to immigration reform makes sense? Well, no, but it makes it sound like the reason why we need background checks is because of those immigrants. Let's get immigration reform, period. And let's go after the notion that these background checks should be universal, period. Let's go and make sure that we, in fact, do not allow, like what I was able to do once with Diane, Diane Feinstein's help, eliminate the ability to have an assault weapon, eliminate to have uh, the ability to have a clip with more than 10 bullets in it. Well, who the hell needs 200 rounds in a gun, in, in, in a weapon? It, I mean, it, that, that is not, the, the president really did not talk about anything relating to, to, to guns today. No, no, I know he had. Yeah, yeah. That, no, I know. That's my point. Right, yeah. Well, it, it, he, he focused on, he talked about video games. He talked about um, mental health, the idea of uh, red flag legislation, identifying somebody ahead of them perhaps committing a crime, maybe even an involuntary confinement for somebody uh, with a mental issue who seems to be a danger. Um, and it, uh, he went on to say that it's not, uh, it's not, uh, it's, it's mental, it's someone with a mental illness or with hatred that pulls the trigger, it's not the gun pulling the trigger. Oh, come on, man. Look, uh, how many times I heard that? Here's the deal. Hatred is not necessarily, it's sick, but it's not a mental illness. To confuse that with a certifiable mental illness. White supremacy is wrong. White nationalism is wrong. It is not a mental illness. It is hateful behavior. It is the way in which people are raised and encouraged to take out their venom on people who they don't like because of the color of their eyes or the color of their skin or the way they walk or where they're from. That is not mental illness. That is a fact, hatred. Hatred. But there's much we don't know about the shooter in, in Dayton yet, uh, but, but certainly it indicates like he had some mental issues or at least some emotional issues early on and obviously with well, other well, shooters. Well, by the way, we, I've always argued that, in fact, there should be people denied the ability to have weapons if they have a mental illness. They should be made aware, the police should be made aware of someone in a background check if they've been treated, just like what happened down in Virginia at Virginia Tech and a whole range of those things. We've been talking about that for a long time. But up until now, our friends, uh, friends, I use that too lightly, uh, you know, the folks on the right have argued that, no, 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 that, that's, that's not anybody's responsibility. They should be able to own a weapon. 
Um, it, 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 look, why, why don't we call this for what it is? This is pure and simple white nationalism, terrorism. It's domestic terrorism, period. So do you, in a Biden administration, would you want to see uh, the FBI able to prosecute domestic terror Absolutely. in the same way that they do international terror? Absolutely. As, right, as of right Department. now, that in itself, domestic terrorism is not in itself a crime. It's usually a weapons charge or, or something else. No, but, but, but there is domestic terrorism. White supremacy is domestic terrorism. So you would like to see a change in law to have domestic terrorism basically be combated the same way that international terrorism yes. is by the FBI. What's the difference? What's the difference? There's been as many, there's more acts by domestic terrorists today than in, in, the, in the past years, and there has been by foreign terrorism, even those who are being recruited. Um, Great. Chris Ray from the FBI just testified the other week that they've had almost as many arrests on domestic terrorism in the three, first three quarters of this year than they have with international terrorism. Yeah. So what's the difference? in terms of the lives of American citizens, innocent people. You, you, you're in support of uh, stronger background checks, uh, universal background checks. Universal background checks. Uh, you're in support of an assault weapons ban. I was able to get one passed. Right, in 1994, the assault yeah. weapons ban. The final studies, though, on the assault weapons ban that, that people point to say it, it basically was kind of inconclusive. They said there were so many guns, all, so many assault-type weapons already on the market um, that it didn't really have a demonstrable effect on the reduction in crime which occurred. There was a reduction in crime, but they can't point at the assault well, weapons. Bill. That's true, but look, here, here's a simple proposition. Let's assume it's all absolutely accurate. Do we want to continue it? Does anybody think it made any sense that someone's able to walk into a gun store, buy an assault weapon that has multiple rounds, or buy an assault weapon that has 100 rounds, even though it may not, you can't point to the fact that it, in fact, had stopped it before. Do you want more of them on the street? Mm. Do we want to do that? So to, to, to gun owners out there who say, well, a Biden administration means they're going to come for my guns. Bingo. You're right if you have an assault weapon. The fact of the matter is they should be illegal, period. Look, the Second Amendment doesn't say you can't restrict the kinds of weapons people can own. You can't buy a bazooka. You can't have a flamethrower. The guys who make these arguments are the people who say the tree of liberty is watered with the blood of patriots. We need the protection against the government. We need an F-15 for that. You need something well beyond whether or not you're going to have an assault weapon. So would you, how would you deal with all the assault weapons that are already out there that people have? What I would do is I would try to, I would institute a national buyback program. And I would move in the direction of making sure that that, in fact, was what we tried to do, get them off the street. But that's not right. confiscating people. No, that, that's not walking into their homes, knocking on their doors, going through their gun cabinets, et cetera. So people would be allowed to keep the weapons they already have? Right now, there's no legal way that I'm aware of that you could deny them the right if they had purchased, legally purchased them. But we can, in fact, make a major effort to get them off the street and out of the possession of people. The uh, Kamala Harris, one of the things she says is that within the first hundred days, if Congress didn't act on uh, gun control efforts or on background checks, she would act by executive order. You can, and we did that in, the, in our administration, act by executive order on 30 different executive orders. The problem with that is when if it's just an executive order, what happens is the next guy comes along and he wipes it all out, which, is, which the president did. Now, you can't, I can't, we, have, we didn't figure out a way you can buy executive order to say you can no longer purchase this particular weapon. You can no longer have a clip with this many bullets in it. You've got to get legislation to do that. But to say that you need to eliminate the gun show loophole, to be, define what constitutes, I'm the guy that pushed the Brady Bill through the United States Congress when I was chairman of the Judiciary Committee on background checks. You can, in fact, do those kinds of things. But you cannot, as a matter of executive order constitutionally, say this is what we're going to do relative to this particular weapon. I think you said you, I, I read you said in the past that you'd had, two, that you have two shotguns. Do you still have two yeah, shotguns? Yeah, I do. I haven't fired them in a long, the only time I've ever used them was my son was alive, skeet shooting. Mm. They're locked up, though, in a cabinet. Every single person who has a weapon should, in fact, be required to have them under lock and key. 
they should be responsible. If you left your keys in your automobile out here in the street and a 15-year-old kid gets in it and gets an accident, you can be held responsible. You're not for a federal uh, license for, for firearms, which some of your Democratic opponents are. Well, we may get to the point. What we have to do is act right now, though, to make sure we do the things that are within our power. Let's get these things off the street now, being able to be sold. Let's move now to deal with thorough background checks. Let's move now. And the difference is, I think the American people now, look, when the president asked me to put together, the former president asked me to put together a series of uh, initiatives that relate to background checks and, 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 and executive orders. This was in the Sandy wake of, uh, of Sandy Hook. And Sandy Hook, uh, I, 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 was, I was able to do that. The problem was that we ended up in a situation where those executive orders, even the ones that got passed that were very useful, that, that were, were implemented, were able to be wiped out. So, but some people will look at that and say, well, President Obama put you, you know, in charge of this commission, you came up with ideas, they didn't pass Congress, for their extens more extensive background checks didn't pass. If it couldn't pass then, why would it pass under a Biden administration? Because the world has changed. People are now aware. What, it, what was clear is that you had over 55, 56 percent of NRA members agreeing with the things we put forward. There's two, we have two real problems. We have the NRA and we have the gun manufacturers. Right now, we're able to make, it's possible technologically to make a weapon that only your biometric on your, your finger can pull that trigger. Right, you've spoken out in favor of uh, smart weapons. Yes, well. okay, now. Smart guns. What happens now? Well, they, they developed some of those in terms of pistols initially. So you had gun, man, gun stores selling them, and what happened? The manufacturers in our came and said, we boycott those. And so they bought they, the, the, those stores. They took them off the market. We've got to take on the gun manufacturers as well as the NRA. All they're interested in is selling a weapon, not about safety. Do you think President Trump is afraid of the NRA? Because he, he, you know, he called in members of Congress, and he, he was making fun even of some uh, members of Congress saying that they were scared of the NRA. He said he would take, he would take it on. And then, and then the first thing he did, he showed up to the NRA and he spoke to them nationally and said, mea culpa, mea culpa, you yeah. know, what do you need, basically? You think he's beholden to the NRA still? Oh, I think he's beholden to his base. I think it's his base. I think he's beholden to the NRA because a significant portion of his base is made up of people who he has identified as uh, uh, being, you know, dividing people into those who are good guys and bad guys. Those who, in fact, are, uh, um, you know, he, he preaches division. That's what it's all about. Look, he speaks to his base, which is somewhere about 35 percent of the American people. A president should speak to everybody, everybody. The base should be Democrats, Republicans, independents across the board. That's not who he is. He's focused on his base, and that's one of the ways he's been able to intimidate some of my Republican colleagues. Part of the conversation I had with former Vice President Biden uh, earlier today. We're going to have more of my exclusive interview with the former Vice President after a short break. As you'll see in a little bit during my exclusive conversation with Vice President Biden today, we talked a great deal about enduring loss after a tragedy. Also about what gun owners he's met have said about gun control and whether he thinks Majority Leader Mitch McConnell would ever let anything substantive get a vote in the Senate. We also discussed President Trump's contention that violent video games are a big part of the problem. Here's more from the conversation with Vice President Biden. When I mentioned that the president talked about video games today as being part of the problem, you, I, I saw you kind of rolled your eyes. It, it's something that people have talked about for a long time. I've talked about it too, but it, not, it, it is not healthy to have these games teaching kids that, you know, is all, all this passionate notion that you can shoot somebody and just, you know, sort of blow their brains out. It, 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 but, but video but, games but, but, are popular in Japan and they No, they are. That's my of. point. But it's not in and of itself the reason why we have this carnage on our streets. Do you think the president's response to El Paso would have been different in terms of what he was calling for if the shooter had been Muslim or an undocumented immigrant? <laughs> you kidding? The fact of the matter, I, my guess is he'd be calling for it anyway. Um, you think it would be? I, I, th I think it would be. And I think that we're what we're talking about here is look at the way he talks about Muslims. Look at the way he talks about immigrants. Look at the way he talks about people of color. Look at the way he talks about them. 
he talks about them almost in subhuman terms. He talks about people of different races and backgrounds as if somehow we were, uh, look, you can't define what an American is based on ethnicity, on race, on religion, on background. There's only one thing that unites us, only one, an agreement on the basic formation of this government, which is we hold these truths. All men are created equal. We never live up to it, but it's that notion, that notion that holds us together. How else do you define an American? other than a commitment, whether they talk about it in terms of a constitution or not, the idea that everybody has a chance. Everybody, is, everybody should have an equal chance in the country. And given a chance, they can do something. That's who we are as a nation. That, we, America's an idea. It's an idea. It's bigger than any damn ocean, more powerful than any army. Only thing that can undermine America, defeat America, is America itself. You don't hear you don't hear this White House talking about that vision of America, that shining sitting on a hill. Um, it can't. How can it talk about it when the language used is always about pitting one group of Americans against another? Whether it's based on your, your sexual identity, whether it's based upon whether you're a man, you're a woman, whether it's based upon your, your origin, where you come from, uh, what your religion is. Come on. Mitch McConnell has not allowed the legislation that's in the House right now to get to the Senate. He's done the same thing on, uh, you know, election security uh, just recently. Why, why do you think he is doing that? I'll make an analogy. Um, no one knew what the Affordable Care Act was until it started to be taken away. I went into 24 states, campaigned for 68 or 69 candidates, Republican areas. We won back the House and the Senate. You didn't hear any Republicans running around the end of this, this last election saying, let's take away pre-existing conditions as being covered. Let's take away. The American public, unfortunately, is getting exposed to just how deeply and badly this nation has been divided by this president and the absolute, absolute sort of, uh, how can I say it, um, uh, attack on the character of the country that's going on. And they're feeling it. They're seeing it. And it's a different place. I met with every one of the families up in, uh, up in Sandy Hook. I met with the families down in, in, in uh, the Pulse nightclub. I met with the kids down in Florida who, when in fact their school was victimized, that they marched and they came up to Washington. Uh, these are people who, in fact, have, you know, you have to put this in human terms. They, and now what the American people are hearing the stories they're seeing. Like I said, up in Sandy Hook, you know what the biggest thing when I met with all, I met with all the police that were there, the state police? Mm. They needed help, mental help, because you know what they talked about? This guy piled babies on top of one another in the classroom and then shot them again. Mm. People should understand. People are beginning to understand the depth of, the depth of the damage and how this is scarring, scarring the country. And, and rhetoric and leadership matters. It matters a lot. It matters. What a president says matters. Like I said, our kids are listening, but the public is going to listen too. They understand if you mean it. They understand what has to be done. The vast majority of the American people think there needs to be rational gun policy. And rational gun policy means, number one, you have to be able to pass a certain background check to be able to own a gun, period. Number two, we can limit the types of weapons you can own and the circumstance in which you can own them. That's constitutionally responsible and al allowable. Number three, you have to be in a position where you let the people know that when you, that you have a responsibility when you own a weapon that you have to care for it. You have to make sure no one else can have access to it. You have to lock it up. You have to have trigger locks. You have to put it in gun cases. And if you don't, you can be held responsible for that. We wouldn't say that about, I mean, everything else we talk about that damages people. You're required to make sure you take certain precautions if something you own that has the potential to be lethal, that in fact it is, it is protected, it is, it is kept away. And they're, they're just basic, basic things that the American people deal with and know that in fact are, uh, and then when you do have the right to purchase a gun because you've had a background check, you shouldn't be able to buy certain weapons because they have no rationale other than. Like when I was campaigning on the assault weapons ban, I'd go through southern Delaware, big, a lot of gun owners in Delaware because of duck hunting, and they'd be fishing and all the tributaries, you know, on the eastern shore there. 
And they said, Joe, what are you taking away my shotgun? And I'd show them a picture of it. So I said, do you think you need this? I said, how many deer out there do you have, if you're going deer hunting, you, you need 30 rounds? And you, you shouldn't be hunting, man. You, 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 what, do you, what do you, no, 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 I don't need that. I don't, this is, and so, I mean, people, when you expose them to what's going on, they understand. And there's a movement occurring in America where we're finally, I think, going to get to the place where there's a rational position on gun ownership. If I could just ask you one more question, and it's a personal question. If you don't yeah. want to answer it, that, that, that's okay. You've, um, you've experienced losses that, that no parent should ever experience. Uh, I'm going to El Paso from here. Um, we'll likely be talking to family members whose child or sister or brother or mother or father has been killed. What, what, as someone who has been through that and lived through that and lives with that every day, what would you, what do you say to, to the people who are grieving right now? You understand it. You lost your brother. You understand. It's, uh, it literally, uh, it really takes a part of your soul. I mean, it, it is. Um, and what I tell people is that uh, um, it's going to take a long time, but the person you lost is still with you, still part of you. And uh, I, I, when it happened to me, when I got a phone call when I was in Washington after I was elected before I got sworn in that my poor, they put a first responder on the phone, God love her, and said, you got to come home. There's been an accident. What happened? A tractor suit. I said, they're dead. Your wife and daughter are dead and your sons. And I remember thinking to myself, my God. Well, I mean, I didn't, I just remember being so angry, angry with everything. And I shouldn't say it, but angry with God, just angry. And I remember, and people would come up to me and say, meaning well, after that, I understand. Hmm. And you feel like saying, you have no idea, you have no idea. You know they mean well. But the people who, in fact, have been through it, you know they understand. Hmm. And it gives you solace that they made it. They just, you just want to know, can I make it through? And I had an a older gentleman, 35 years my senior, a former elected official in the state of New Jersey, call me, former governor. And he said, I understand. I almost said to him, and he said, you know, I was walking home from lunch. I was the attorney general. And my wife came, uh, uh, a woman who helps out once we came running across the mall saying, she's dead, she's dead, your wife just died. And I said, and I realized he did know. And he said, you know what I did? And my advice, it helped me anyway, is two things. One, he said, get a piece of graph paper and mark every single day how you felt from one to 10 that day. Mm. Because you know you lost your brother when a thought would come to you after a while, you'd be down and just as down as the moment it happened. Mm. And he said, don't look at it for six months. Mark it on the graph paper, one to 10. The downs will be just as far down, but you know you're gonna make it when they get further and further and further and further apart. You still get down. It never goes away. But it never goes away, but, but, that's when you know you can make it. That's when you know you can embrace the family members that are left. That's when you know that you can make a contribution. It's like when I lost my son, um, Bo. I remember him saying to me, you know, I wrote a book about it, unfortunately. It was harder than I thought I was gonna be able, I wanted people to know what he was like. Yeah. And he looked at me when he, at, we'd go home and on Fridays to have dinner with him. He lived about a mile from us. And he asked his wife and his, to take the kids upstairs. And, uh, and my wife had gone home to change before she came back. We got right off the train. And he said, um, Dad, look at me, Dad. He said, I'm going to be okay no matter what happens. He knew he only had months to go. And, uh, and he said, but promise me, Dad. Promise me you'll be okay. And I said, Bo, I'll be okay. And I know people make fun of it. We have a thing in our family. He said, Dad, promise me it's a Biden. Give me your word as a Biden. You'll be okay. Because that's the sacred thing we do. And I said, I will, Bo. But I knew what he meant. He meant, Dad, don't do what you want to do. You want to turn inward. You want to just wall yourself off. You don't want to be part of it all. He just wanted me to make sure that the things that have animated my life, my whole life, I didn't walk away from. He knew I'd take care of the kids. He knew I would be 
there for the family. But it's the thing, the other thing I would strongly urge people, and they can't do it now. It just can't even think through the, the fog right now. But eventually, what will take you through is purpose. Find a purpose, something that matters, particularly if it's something connected to the loss you just had. And, uh, and so, I'm being too personal, but if I get up in the morning and I think to myself in the morning, is he proud of me? Am I doing what he wants? And I'm sure that uh, it's the same way with you and a whole lot of other people. And, uh, but at a moment, there will come a time when you think of the person you lost, it takes a long while, where you get a smile before you get a tear. Hmm. And um, that's when you know you're going to make it. And so many people have gone through what I've been through without the help I had. Think of all the heroes out there walking those streets today. They get up every single morning. They put one foot in front of the other and they move. They move. My mom used to say the saying, it's from a Scottish philosopher, and the, the, the saying is, uh, be kind because everybody you meet is fighting a great battle. And exactly that's right. that's a really important thing. You know, and uh, you know, uh, um, Kierkegaard also said, Faith sees best in the dark. Sometimes it's really dark, but there is hope. And think about what it means for those family members you have left. They need you. They need you. And look, folks, uh, um, that's why I think that it matters, the stories of these people, for the public to understand that this is not just a statistic. This is, this is, this is who, who we are, who they are. I mean, it's a, and it really is about, you know, sort of reweaving that social fabric that holds the society together. Honesty, decency, hope, leaving nobody behind, giving hate no safe harbor. We don't always live up to them. That's, that, that's who we are. That's who we are. And it's the thing that holds us together. And, uh, and I don't see much of it coming from the far right and the bright parts of the world and, the, and, and this administration. It's, uh, it's the uniqueness of America. Mr. Vice President, thank you very much. Sorry, I didn't mean to get so personal. No, I, I appreciate uh, it. Um, well. It helps. Well, you know, I mean, it's, I, it's, just, it's just amazing how it's, um, everybody knows who Donald Trump is. We gotta let them know who we are, man. Even his supporters know who he is. They have no illusions about the basic fundamental character traits. I mean, it's, um, and I think, some, I think sometimes he thinks that, uh, when we talk about this thing, that we talk about other people, like we're being suckers, you know, like we're not, take care of yourself. I mean, I, 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 I don't know. I don't, we, we let them know that, uh, you know, we choose hope over fear, you know? Mm. Unity over division. And maybe most importantly, uh, truth over lies. It's, uh, it, it's, but they gotta make sure that, we're, not because I'm running, we got to make sure that the American people understand, if you're, whoever you're trying to lead, that you mean what you say. There's some authenticity to it, mm. and it matters. And you know as well as I do, it really matters. As President Joe Biden's message to America and to the victim families here in El Paso, Texas, and Dayton, Ohio. Up next, Chris Cuomo.